Hello, and welcome to this Motorsport Magazine podcast in association with Mercedes-Benz. Great design is not only how things look, but also how well they work. The new GLC Urban Edition, now from £349 per month for a limited time only. Now, joining me today um, is Alistair Caldwell and Freddie Hunt. And we'll be mainly looking back on the career of James Hunt, who uh, next month will be the 25th anniversary of uh, his when he passed away. But first off, I think we should have a catch up with Alistair and Freddie about what you've both been up to, because you've both been very busy, I think. Uh, uh, Freddie, you've been filming all manner of people. Yeah. Um, when we started, we thought, well, A, for this, um, something for the anniversary this year, um, but also I'd never really had a chance to sit down with, with, with these certain people and, and talk to them. Um, certainly, not, certainly not Bernie. I'd met yeah. him five minutes in the paddock once, but we all know that actually have a sit down and chat, so so we organised that, and for Haviland, our sponsors, obviously they wanted some good content, so we thought sure. it would all work well. Uh, uh, Hesketh, yeah, my, 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 my dear godfather, who I have, I've only seen him once since Dad's yeah. funeral, right. um, but anyway, I thought I'd better have a chat with him too. So yeah, well, I think tomorrow that's happening, so right. right then. And then the last was with, um, with Murray Walker, but unfortunately, uh, it was postponed, uh, so it's going to happen. We're yet to fix the date, right. but we'll be soon. Um, and then in between, you've been sort of trying to get to Le Mans as well. Well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, that's the, me- the immediate things we're doing right now. Um, Le Mans is very much the target. We have some sponsorships for the twenty-four hour series, but really, what we're really looking for a little bit more, a little bit more funding to, to go into the LMP3 car, but they're slightly right. more expensive than GT4. Uh, a lot more expensive. Right. Um, and well, once I get some practice in that, and then assuming that all goes well, and we get keep getting some sponsorship in, and then we want to the mall. And you recently won a coat, is that correct? Yeah, so that that was that was a real good one. So that was in November um, at Cota with with two teammates. I hadn't really really met before, driven before properly, but um, but we all got really well. And, Ended up winning the race, much to my surprise. Yeah. <laughs> so we weren't the fastest at all. Right. Um, but it turns out, well, we were by the end of it. Yeah. And we looked after the car, we didn't have any issues. Well, and any major issues. I think we lost half a lap or something like that. But the, uh, I think it was the well, a computer of some sort. Right. Threw its toys out of the pram. That was but anyway, yeah. So, yeah, it was just, we Excellent. went slowly and won it. Yeah. And Alice, you've been doing your own kind of endurance driving around Cuba. <laughs> yes, I, well, I, as you probably know, I do an awful lot of uh, historic rallying, and uh, I enjoy it. I've got a fleet of old cars these days, you know, I've got quite a few horses, of course, and yep. so on. And uh, I've got a mother who lives in New Zealand, uh, who's still alive. She's 100 years old. She had her 100th birthday on the 6th of January. So I went out there for her birthday, and then I had my 75th, so we, we had two birthdays, her 100th. And then a few weeks later, I had my 75th, so we had 175th. Excellent. We joined them two together and, and advertised it as the 175th <laughs> birthday. And uh, so that was quite good fun. Meanwhile, I'd also entered a rally in Cuba. I was a uh, nearly four weeks long rally in Cuba. And getting to Cuba is not so easy for New Zealand. No. You've got to get to Cuba, you don't start in New Zealand. You know, <laughs> so I had to go backwards to through Chile and Panama to Cuba and then back through Panama to Chile, decide to stop in Santiago and have a look around Santiago for a few days, which was very nice, and then back to New Zealand. And, uh, you know, just been holiday, really. I've got a daughter who lives in Australia, so I go backwards and forwards, Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, the Maldives, uh, trying to keep out of England for the winter time. I managed it, got back here to brilliant sunshine, so yeah. it, was, it was good good management. And you maintained your record of never failing to finish a rally? Yes, I, I was just—I didn't really think about that. Yes, but I've done many, many of these long-distance rallies. Some of them enormous, you know, over huge distances. And uh, I've only ever failed to finish two, and that's both because women were involved and they wouldn't let me fix the car, you know, or whatever, you know. <laughs> uh, because, uh, but the car, you know, they were voluntary withdrawals, you know, if you like. You know, right. So I've always—I've finished every one. I'm, I'm not, of course, I've broken down many times, but I'm a quite adept mechanic. I started at McLaren's as a mechanic. You know, I was a mechanic as a boy. 
served my time as an apprentice mechanic. So I'm, a, I'm still a mechanic. You know, I still yep. know a lot about cars and can fix them. And you were just telling Freddie the story about how you joined McLaren. That one oh, day. it's an old story, yes. yes one day we're, as a cleaner. Uh, back in 67, when I arrived in England in, the, in June 67, I went to McLaren straight away on the Monday morning because I needed to get work. Because uh, you know, I needed to work because I was only 23 and a married man with two small children already. I needed to earn. But I wanted to be, I came to England to go Grand Prix racing. Yeah. That was my whole idea. One year, two years at the most. Because New Zealand uh, race mechanic was I think, something you did in the summer. Nobody did it professionally. There was no 20, you know, three months. Nobody was employed as a race mechanic all year. You might be employed in the garage and work for three months in the summer, but not the whole year. And uh, so I wanted to try it, you know, as a proper professional mechanic. So I came and McLaren was the obvious choice. I was an honorary New Zealander, I had a New Zealand passport, I'd met Bruce. And uh, I wrote to McLaren weeks before, or even months before, and said I, I was coming, but, you know, I got no reply. and didn't expect to get a reply, because they probably got hundreds of those. You just put them in the bin. And uh, anyway, I turned up and um, asked for a job as a mechanic, and they said they didn't have any job as a mechanic, but they did need a cleaner. And I said, because I asked, do you have any jobs at all? They said, cleaner. So um, the next morning, Tuesday morning, I started as a cleaner, and I cleaned all day, and I looked at the race car, because they had this one uh, former two car with a V8, two litre V8 in it, which they were racing as a Grand Prix car. I'm doing quite well, um, and winning points with it even. And, uh, and uh, at the end of the day, at five o'clock when I finished work, I went over and asked them if they needed a hand, and they did. So I changed the ratios in the gearbox, and then I started to fabricate bits for it, and I worked all night, till two o'clock in the morning. And uh, then Tyler, who was Tyler Alexander, who sadly has just recently died, was a director of the company in those days, and a very strong friend of Bruce's, um, said, oh, we're going to go home now. So I said to him, when do you get to work? And he said, 7.15. It's quite precise. And I said, okay. So I got my aunt to bring me back to McLaren at 7 and sat on the wall outside, little brick wall outside, and Tyler turned up at 7.15, took me inside, gave me things to do on the race car. And when the guy that hired me as a cleaner got to work, he said, oh, Harry, he said, you need a new cleaner because this bloke's a mechanic. So he didn't talk to me about it. I just, you know, I became a mechanic. And then Bruce came along and they said, oh, are you working on the car now? I said, yeah, yeah okay, fine, that was it. So I was a mechanic. And, uh, Can't work out that's an easy way or a difficult way in. Yes. <laughs> and my first race was the uh, Italian Grand Prix in 67. It was the last race of the season in Europe before they went to Canada and America. So I, I, got, I, went, I went to that race. Uh, with Bruce with a V12 engine car. I couldn't tell you, I think it was an M5 or something. Any curvy thing, but it looked yeah. like an eagle with a V12 BRM engine. Right. And that, I could tell stories about that for hours. <laughs> and, you're, and you're back involved, McLaren? I've got recently a bit you know, more involved, yes, because during the, the Ron era, I, I, there was nothing active about it. I just didn't fancy Ron. And right. Ron was always in denial that McLaren's had any kind of success before he came along. He tried to make out that he invented the, the style of McLaren's and he did the DNA of McLaren's, which was the best presented cars, the most reliable cars, and the best engineered cars were there long before Ron arrived. Because our cars were the nicest cars, if you want to use the word. Our cars were the most handsome cars in the pit road. They're all beautifully prepared. They're always more reliable than anybody else's. So that's just a statistical fact. Yep. My cars, I like to call them, <laughs> they did more miles in Grand Prix than anybody else's, like Tyrrells or Lotus or Ferraris. My cars were, there they were at the flag. And, um, and they were always beautifully presented, and so was the team. You know, we had uniforms, and uh, so we were, we were a smart team, and that DNA um, still lives on, which came from Bruce and Tyler and me, not, yeah. not from Ron. Ron inherited that. Yeah. Did you have any things with Ron? Was he open with you and engaging? Ron, no, I haven't, I haven't met Ron what, uh, much. Um, he was, I rang him up when I first started racing, not asking for sponsorship, but asking for help, but asking for advice. How did one go about getting sponsorship? Anyway, after about three weeks of trying to get through his secretary, he eventually picked up the phone. Right. And he said, the first thing he says is, you've got five minutes. It took me about four minutes to get my tongue together. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was terrified. I was an 18-year-old. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So that wasn't very... I didn't think very highly of him after that. Um, then I think the next time I saw him was on a boat in Monaco at the Grand Prix. But 
maybe what, four years ago or something now, because there's everyone around. And, oh, Freddie, great to see you. Right. Yeah, have a drink. They sent me a little. Okay. Yeah, so a little bit different. That's right. about it. Um, right. Mum said, said he was wonderful to wind up. He used to go for dinner around at his house. And um, he was OCD. Mom, Dad would deliberately kick his shoes off in the other direction and then go and move things around those mandrel beats. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I, 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 when, when, I, when I first started, of course, Ron, which we would never admit to, was a Brabham mechanic. Yep. And very similar to me in, in um, position, I would say. Uh, not that I ever thought about it at the time, but I was a very, um, how could I say, effective mechanic. I was very much, you know, and I was actually in charge of the Grand Prix team. I didn't have the title, and I didn't have the name or the money, but I was doing it. And Ron was doing very similar with Brabham's. You know, he, he, he had Toronac and Brabham, who were the, the owners and you know, joint owners. But Ron was doing a huge amount of the, of the running of the team, you know, making the cars run just like I was doing. I was running McLaren's, and the, you know, the management was not doing anything. They were just standing around whistling, really. Because I was doing it all, even though even when I wasn't chief mechanic, when I became chief chief mechanic, and Ron went off and started Rondell Racing, yep. which I didn't have any interest in at all, because I was so terribly focused on the Grand Prix team. My job, I didn't pay any attention to what anybody else was doing. Formula Three, Formula Two, in, in nothing, just Formula One. And that was all I was interested in. Try to get my mechanics and so on to be the same. I didn't want them being distracted by anything else. Right. So Rondell Racing was not something in my um, image at all, and then to jump ahead, you know, when I left McLaren's because I fell out with Teddy and resigned, um, Ron was hired as my replacement, and he was hired by Philip Morris because Philip Morris wanted very much to keep McLaren's going, they didn't want it to collapse. And Teddy was driving it into the ground, which is why I left. And sadly, I didn't realize the power I had until too late because I went to work for Bernie. And then when I talked to Philip Morris at the next race, they said, What are you doing? Why don't you talk to us? because we wanted to get rid of Teddy as well. Yeah, so if I right. talked to them, they would have got me, engineered me to get rid of Teddy. But I did the wrong thing, I left. Left Teddy there, so they were stuck with Teddy. Uh, I hate to talk to Teddy. What year was that? Teddy, uh, 80, 79. Yep. And, uh, so then they got Ron in, and Ron got rid of Mrs. McLaren, um, Tyler, and Teddy. He pushed them out of the nest, basically. He was like a cuckoo, they just gave him enough money to buy them out, and now they were in control. And uh, Ron always claimed to own McLaren's, so I'm certain he never did, um, because why would Philip Morris give him the company? You know, right. Philip Morris had the company for a long time. And he had some shares in it, but not he didn't own it. And then that, I think that came out to be true, when it finally hit the family, he had 25% or something. And if you know something about private companies, 25% is actually nothing, because <laughs> the people who've got the other 75%, if you've got 51% of a private company, then you're in charge. Doesn't matter what the other people are doing, what they think they can do. They actually can't do anything if you don't want them to. Anyway, that's politics. You know, I, I was not involved in that at all. I, did, went off, I went off to work for Bernie. How did Bernie compare to Bruce? Oh, totally different. Yeah, Bruce was a, a very nice. Uh, you know, uh, Bruce worked with his people. You know, worked, Bruce built cars. I mean, literally, he came to work and built cars. Uh, yep. Literally built, you know, drilled holes in bits of metal, and you know, assisted. Even if he didn't physically work, he worked, you know, with the crew. Uh, Bruce's only limitation was that he could only concentrate on one car at a time. You know, he wasn't a multitasker. He liked Indy car or Can Am car or Formula One car, but not all three. So when I had the Formula One car, and he was madly interested in Can Am, he would just go past me in the morning and go hi and hi, and then he'd go down the, to the other shop, you know, and work on the Can-Am cars all day, and then go back in the evening. That would be it. Wouldn't even talk during the day. Or we'd go to the pub and talk racing cars at the pub, because we did a lot of car racing in the pub, you know, at lunchtime. Did a lot of designing. Really? Uh, oh, yes. on, on, on oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, literally on bits of paper, same old story. Wow. Oh, we could do the wing like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we'd go back and we'd do it. We would, we would literally do it. We would just go back and make the new wing. The bigger wing, the higher wing, the taller wing, the one mounted on the uprights or whatever, which had been designed at lunchtime. Drawing office had nothing to do with it. <clears throat> wow. Because a huge amount of McLaren's was nothing to do with the drawing office. And that, that, that's gone right on its head now. You know, they don't even breathe without the drawing office telling them exactly what to do. You know, they probably tell them you know, what, what cadence they're allowed to breathe. You know, <laughs> and where they have to stand on the floor. Whereas in our day, we, we got a chassis like a plank, a chassis, and with the bolt the engine on, and the rest of it was more or less done by us. 
all the oil system, all the water system, all the fuel system, all the gear change, dashboard, everything was just done by the mechanics. And we did it very well, it all worked beautifully. And the very first uh, Grand Prix car that I worked on, you know, that had been designed, was designed by Robin Hurd. And we built it, a, a little guy called, Mc, um, you know, we built it like we did overnight. And we put it on the ground at four o'clock in the morning and it, it had like 12 inches ride height because the suspension was totally wrong. It was just stupidly wrong. You know, he des it was designed wrong. Right. It couldn't possibly work. But being what we were, we then put the car on wooden blocks, four inches in the front, six inches in the back, cut the suspension off, you know, the, the suspension mounts, and remounted it all, welded it all, made bushes, made it all up, put it on the ground, looking good, took it to Goodwood, and it ran that day. Wow. And the suspension had been designed by Alan McCorn and I in two hours. Just a relocated totally on the car. And when Heard got to work with Bruce, we said, he said, what's how was it? I was a load of old rubbish. Yeah, just rubbish. And he said, oh, okay. Is it good now? I said, yeah. He said, I'll draw that tomorrow. So Brilliant. he used to come down and say, have you boys finished this car yet? And we'd say, no, no, we're going to do this. And he said, okay, well, you let me know when you're done. And he'd come down and draw it. So quite often, the drawing office was following what this workshop floor was doing instead of the other way around. And then they would come up with drawings and we'd go, oh, no way. We're not building that. That's stupid. And we'd change it and then we'd tell them. Yeah, we didn't do it like that. We did it like this. They'd go, oh, okay. Did that then change your Brabham? Did oh, no. Brabham was all drawn by Gordon. Yeah. Totally different. Right. Yeah. And Bernie was, was a, a, a malevolent force who lived across the yard, didn't even come in the workshop. And though he was there every day, he, you never knew where he was because he made very, very careful to make sure nobody ever knew where he was, ever. Right. And he would just turn up. Boom, there he'd be. You're in the drawing office. See and, and to see us. And we didn't know he was there and this was all unannounced. And uh, it was my job in those days to take him around the factory. And, uh, right. and I could tell stories see. about taking Bernie around the factory. <laughs> I, wrote, I could just go on and on. Anyway, so Bernie, working with Bernie was totally different from working at McLaren's. Bernie had the whole factory divided into rooms, all painted white with up and over garage doors, which must have been the cheapest thing you could find to divide them up. And if you were in the wrong place you got sacked if he came in the machine shop and there was a mechanic in the machine shop he sacked him because he wasn't meant wow. to be in the machine shop but he was in the machine shop because he was taking something you know to show the machine shop that this should have been like that or whatever. but it didn't matter to bernie he was sackable wow. out what did you learn from bernie Freddie, when you met him last week well not an awful lot actually i asked him um what would be the best advice you can give me? Or, you know, well, no, what's the, you know, the key to success? And he said, luck. <laughs> I, was, I was hoping for something a bit more detailed than that, Bernie, you know? Yeah. I just sit and think luck, think lucky things. Yeah, be lucky. Uh, sorry? <laughs> yeah, be lucky, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Well, he was lucky. He got the whole thing because he, I don't, I don't think he had any idea how easy it was to take over Grand Prix races. Well, it's what I, I still quite, can't quite understand. I should have asked him this, actually. How does one go and acquire the TV rights that they weren't there in the first place? Did he just say to all the, all the team owners, I'm going to do this, I'm going to pay you this, and then I can do whatever no, I want with TV? I mean, how, how did it well, work? I, once again, this is, I don't know how long you got. <laughs> <laughs> but I was there when he turned up. He bought the, he bought the Bram Grand Prix team yeah, he had as that. a win. Yeah. I don't know why. And he bought it for pennies because Toronac, Jack, I think, gave it to Toronac. John Toronac was the designer, mm -hmm. and he and Jack had Rams together. And then Jack went, got homesick and went home to Australia and left Toronac with the company. Whether Toronac paid him much for it, or I don't know. You know I have no idea, because once again, that's politics way beyond me. But anyway, uh, uh, Toronac was left running Rams on his own, and I don't think he was enjoying it. He liked the friction with Rams. Jack, he and Jack used to argue in the pit road like Italians. They were really quite funny. And though they were meant to be Australians and calm, they actually used to have big shouting matches in the pit road, so you could watch, which were always good fun. Anyway, so Tarnak got sad of you know, and got homesick as well, I think. So I believe sold Brabham's to Bernie for Rock All. This is before people realised that Grand Prix teams could be the actual team could be worth a lot of money. So he got this factory and all the cars and so on. Tarnak went home and he turned up at South Africa and we had a rental caravan as a meeting point for the Focal or FIFA, I forget what it's called, Focal days, Formula One Constructors Association, which was a, a you know, all the teams together in a, in a union, Focal. And uh, Bernie was a new boy and he got 
brought in by Tyrrell. Ken Tyrrell was the star, you know, he was the big man. He was also winning the World Championship. You know, he was the one with the, and he was the chairman. And he introduced Bernie, this little tiny guy. He said, this is Bernie Eccleston. We all shook hands with him. And I was the McLaren representative because Teddy was away skiing. And uh, Bernie wouldn't sit at the table. He only sat on a, on a banquet on the side. But he listened to everything and nobody wanted to do anything. The simple thing was that all the Grand Prix teams just wanted to go Grand Prix racing. They didn't want to run Grand Prix, the Grand Prix. Nobody wanted to run Fergus. And they had a guy called Ferguson, was an ex-Lotus employer, I think. And he was quite strong, so they got rid of him because they didn't want anybody strong. And they got a guy called Macintosh, who was not strong. So they're all very strong personalities, but they didn't want to do any work. They just wanted to get McLarens or Lotus or Tyrrells or Ferraris faster, you know, and better, beat the others. They didn't want to negotiate, and all the, all the organisers had them all divided. They needed to be a you know, concentrated unit to negotiate everything, TV, track appearances, start money. It had to be a collective. And um, Bernie turned up, listened to the, what was going on, realised that none of them wanted to do anything, and volunteered to do things. So they were put on the agenda, and like any meeting, we had an agenda, and Bernie Eccleston, Bernie Eccleston, Bernie Eccleston. And then two weeks later, the next Grand Prix, there he was again, but this time sitting at the table, and he had half the items. And the next one, which I was also at, which was six, six weeks, he was chairman, and he had all the stuff, and he just took it all over. And they were all happy to have Bernie do it all. And Bernie's very clever. Bernie knew that information was power, and now he had all the information about everything. He knew about who drove drivers, what drivers were, and people were calling him up and asking him, and he always answers the phone. You don't, you don't get anybody saying, you know, Mr. Eccles is in a meeting. You either get him or you don't get him. And he says, yes, what do you want? And yes or no, or I'll get back to you. It's, he's very, very good. Yeah, he's, very, he's very good at this. He takes hundreds of phone calls and deals with it all himself. You know, you, if you rang up Bernie, he would either answer the phone or not answer the phone. You didn't get a girl saying, I'll get back to you in two days, or he's in a meeting, or he's away. Nothing. Just bang. But if he picked up the phone, what do you want? Yes, no, and put the phone down. And he, and he, and he got himself into you know position of, of, of running all the teams. And then he realized that the real money was in the TV rights. And yes. he didn't have them. And the FIA had them, so he tried to get them off the FIA. And we had this famous race at Imola where all the English teams didn't race. There was a strike. Uh, Avon re removed the tyres, and, and only Ferraris, Renault, and ATS, which I was now running, ran. We had like an eight car race. All the English teams sat there and went home and uh, trying to break the list, but this still didn't break it. So then in the end, he realised the only thing he could do was to get rid of the list. And to do this, he got Max Mosley, who was his sidekick. Um, a very clever lawyer, and he went round the world, and as far as I know, I maybe get slandered by Max, but you know, somehow or other managed to get all these little countries to vote for him to be president of the FIA instead of the list. So now Max was president of the FIA and therefore was able to give a lease for the TV rights to Bernie. This is a matter of fact. I think it's a 100-year lease. Ridiculous lease. In other words, gave it to him. So now Bernie really had something to sell. And now he really had some power. Up until then, he'd just done it by sheer force of personality, by the fact that he was the man to go to, and everybody asked him what to do, and he did it. But he didn't actually, he didn't own the teams, he didn't own the racetracks, he didn't own anything, really. He just did it by sheer force of personality, and the fact that his work ethic was fantastic. He does it all. He parked all the trucks in the paddock, believe me. You know, he, he only had two or three employees, and he did it all. He, you know, if you were out of favour with Bernie, you were parked in a field over there. If you're in favour, you were next to his truck. You know, he, he, he was a micromanaged it. He micromanaged it. They all let him get away with it because nobody else wanted to get involved. Okay, that's the story. And then he, he, he engineered Max to be president of the FIA and then got given the FIA, the, the TV rights, and now he had the licence to print billions. What but for he... some reason, he was interested in selling it. I've never understood that why he wanted to sell it, but he did. Once then he, he immediately tried to sell it. So what? The rights, the TV rights that tried to sell this package. Formal. He did in the end. He sold it twice or three, two or three times. Oh really? What, over, over the years since the 70s? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I don't know. I didn't follow the history, but you know, he had all these hundred trucks which were all beautifully put up and he, he tried the digital thing where all the cars were going to have digital cameras and 
I don't remember it, but he tried to sell it and he got this famous female to, tr to try and sell it. But everybody who came to look at it had a look and when they finally lifted up the carpet, there was nothing to sell because Bernie didn't actually own anything. Right. He just owned the idea, but he didn't own any of it. So he actually he really had nothing to sell until he got the TV rights. And now he really did have something to sell. And he sold it once to a German company that went immediately bankrupt. And that was the guy who, you know, the banker who's still in jail. Still uh, bank. Uh, because of the bribes and blah, blah, blah. And then he sold it to CB Capital Partners. Yep. And uh, he ran it for them. So he got a bunch of money from CB Capital Partners. And maybe it's just been pre-essent. He thought it was going to fade. You know, it wasn't going to last forever. So he might as well sell it. But he had so much money by then, I don't know what he's doing, just playing a game. You know, it doesn't matter if he lives to a thousand, you never spend the money. You know, you, there's a limited amount of money you can spend, and Bernie must have plenty. What, what did he make of teams like Hesketh when they came into the paddock? I mean, it was, by then, it was a serious kind of championship. You guys at the front were taking the sport. Very oh, I don't know. I never discussed anything with Bernie. I think he would have been very pleased because it was TV and it's all good for TV. You know, people who behave, you know, erratically and, 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 and you know, have lots of girls around and helicopters and champagne. Nothing, you know, nothing wrong with that because that's just good TV coverage and, and the public like that. So I would think he would have welcomed them with open arms, would have given them every uh, encouragement. Right. Because he, the, you, there's nothing wrong with colour. Nothing wrong with colour at all. I mean, as you could say now with modern Grand Prix, so there's no colour at all. They're all like robots. Yes. A lot of them. Well, Lewis's new haircut's quite colourful, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, so the haircut of the, one of the leading yeah, drivers yeah. Is, is the main... Uh, is the main... Is the main... Is the main entertainment. Of, of <laughs> entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's a brief history of Grand Prix racing from my, yes. my, from my <laughs> viewpoint. Remember, this is all based on supposition. I don't have any facts here, but they're all correct. <laughs> <laughs> what did you make of Eskis when they... So Esker, rock, yeah, when they appeared in the paddock. Oh, once again, they abused. They were fine. You know, it didn't see them as a threat. No. See, when you turn up in Grand Prix racing, it doesn't matter who, what team you are. Unless you win a race, you're not really a problem. Right. Or we start to consistently finish in the points. Yeah. And uh, so you don't pay much attention to them because they're just a nuisance. Well, they're not a nuisance. They just add to the colour and it's good and they drive a training. And, uh, when so, was it? it was, was it was it 73 that they first entered with a hard, with a, in a hard chassis? Was it 72? Yes, I probably didn't I know because yeah, I was too busy. But, but yeah. I think by, by 74, he was challenging the top three. I mean, not finishing there, but yeah, he was yeah. fighting. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they were potentially there. And of course, in 75, was it? 75, they won the, won the yeah. was Dutch, Dutch Grand Prix he was by winning mistake. The, he was winning the, um, or you could say by skill, but we would have said by mistake because they stopped at the wrong time. But God smiled on them. They got lucky. They stopped at the wrong time. No, you just read the... You just, just I've, read I've, I've read loads. Of, I've read loads of different <laughs> anyway, versions. We would, of it. we would have said that he won it by mistake. Sorry, I can't even remember the circumstances. But he was leading the um, the Argentine Grand Prix, wasn't he? And he spun it. They got out too overexcited and spun up the hairpin and finished fourth or something or third. Yeah, once that may have been the seventy four. Well, seventy five. He won the first Grand Prix. We thought by mistake, and you get lots of congratulations then because people think you've done it once, but you're not going to do it again. It's okay. Right. You know, it was even like Brabham's winning a Grand Prix in those days. You know, because they were so unreliable. You went, oh, well done. You know, but you thought. They won't be back next week. They won't be there. So, what, 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 were your, what were your emotions when you found when when Dan it was confirmed that he was going to drive with you guys the following season? Well, uh, were you yeah, worried? Well, we thinking, oh, I wasn't worried. No, no, uh, interested, just interested. Um, I mean, literally, as I remember it, your father rang me up and said, "I think I'm your new Grand Prix driver." Had he already, he already spoken to Teddy? Uh, no. Well, no. how, did, how did he? Oh, no, because he had uh, spoken to Emerson. The, pub, the publicity came that, that Philip Pauli yeah. has quit. Yeah, yeah. And, and this was news to us. Yeah, he was negotiating with Philip Pauli. Well, and Philip Pauli was trying to get more money mm -hmm. out of Philip Morris, double the money, huge amount of money in those days. I believe, if I remember rightly, $2 million right. instead of $1 million. He wanted $2 million. And they, they said, why? You know, $1 million is a lot. You know, uh, and where are you going to go? Because the music stopped. Because Grand Prix racing, like all racing, is like musical chairs. Towards the end of the season, the music yeah. stopped. And if you're not sitting in a car, you, 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 you've had it. And the only place for Philip Pauli in a competitive car was in our car, which was the most competitive car anyway. He just won the World Championship with it. Mm -hmm. yeah, so he either had to drive for Ferraris, but all the other seats were full. So Philip Morris didn't think they had to negotiate with him. Because what was he going to do apart from retire? 
as it was, he was silly enough to build another Kapasuka um, and drive a second Kapasuka. And he got probably paid $2 million by then and two, $10 million to build a car. I have no idea, but something like that. They went off to Brazil you know, and built his own car. They already had one brother's car. team, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Wilson. Well, it was their team. It was their team. Okay. So Emerson decided to drive for himself. They must have got enough sponsorship from the Brazilian government to pay himself a fortune. So he went off uh, and we had no drive. Meanwhile, um, Mrs. Hethkes, as far as I know, decided she had enough of her boy squandering her money and told him it was over because she was in charge. Yeah, not, yeah. yeah, the lady with the patch, uh, yeah. uh, quite eccentric, said, I've had enough of this, boys. You, you're out. You're finished. Go home. Get out of the place. You know, leave. Go away. And yeah. uh, so your father was out of a, of a drive. So he had experience. You know, he was good. We'd seen him win races. So he was the obvious choice. And uh, it just went like that. We just fitted like a glove. And he said, I think I'm your new driver. I said, I guess you are. You just have to talk to Teddy about the money, but it won't be a lot. But then he, he didn't pay <laughs> the car. Because he could have paid us. I mean, he could have done it for free. You know, we had the best car, yeah. or the second best car, but certainly either, th you know, either Ferrari or McLaren was the drive. And uh, so he got, you know, he got paid not a lot. I remember he, 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 several times I've heard you, heard you say he was the you know, cheapest world champion ever. Yeah. Do you remember how much he was paid? Was it like 10000 no. or something? Oh, I, I, I don't know. It's probably like fifty grand or something. And, and appearance money and or prize money, I think. Some right. choice, you know, but not much. And he always moaned about it. And it was fantastic because, you know, on the grid, if I wanted to get him going, I would, I would talk about money. <laughs> you know, when he was in the car, sitting you know, at the start of the Grand Prix. And I would, we, in those days, we didn't have a radio. We plugged in. You know, we actually literally had a socket on the side of the car and he had, you know, things that he right. sold. Oh, right. We'd plug in and chat, you know, and then you could, and three people could plug in or four, you know, and have a, you know, Teddy would be plugged in because Teddy always ran the number one car, you know, because he was the team owner and I ran the number two car, but I back ran all of them. But, you know, anyway, so I'd come in and chat and I'd say on the grid, oh, how are you getting to Tokyo, you know, James? Coming first class, are you? <laughs> and I'd leave him and Teddy having a huge argument about money on the grid yeah, before the lights were about to go out. And that was good because he, he got my well. man right revved up. <laughs> and off he'd go. So, uh, yeah, he was a natural fit. And as you know, we, we, it's history. We went to Silverstone. I think it was snowing and to, to, to test him. And the only thing we found out that the car was too small for him. So yeah, we actually had to extend the pedals. Less. We put the pedals. Shoes off as well. He had very long. Was it even, he had, even, he had even a strange shape. Your, dad. your dad had a very short body and very long legs. You know, his waist was very high off the ground, so he had very long legs yeah. and a normal sized torso. So he sat in the car fine, but his legs. You know, were, so he actually had to extend the bulkhead, and put the master cylinders an inch further forward for Brazil. Then we flew to Brazil, and uh, I always remember poor Jochen saying, "Who's number one on the team?" And I said, "No, oh, Jochen, you've always been confused by this." The number one on the team is the one who's quickest. You know, it doesn't matter whether the guy's got number one tattooed on his forehead. If he's slower than number two, then he's number two. You know, just the way it works. You know, if if um, Botas starts to outqualify qualify Vettel racer, uh, um, uh, uh, um, anyway, if the second driver starts to outqualify the mm. first driver, the whole team goes. And suddenly he's the first driver. Anyway, we went to Brazil, and after half an hour, we had no screens in those days, or didn't there. Jochen said, how's it going? I said, oh, you're sixth, and James is tenth, or something. Oh, fantastic. And then half an hour later, he said, how's it going now? I said, oh, you're not going to like it too much now. And James is on pole, and you're eighth, which is kind of normal. <laughs> didn't you get pole? Was like it was a, on pole. A quarter of a tenth, though, wasn't it? Was, it was on it, was pole. It? First race. Mm. And uh, sadly, uh, Reliability let us down. The engine builders let us down, and the trumpet fell off the engine. Nick, because Nick, 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 got the better start, like most of the races. Dad, I read, read in one of Dad's books, one that's written while he was alive. He was terrified of buggering the clutch the whole time. That's why he always he was always so bad off the line. Nick, he would all, he would always the clutch the front was road. the clutch. He would the always clutch was off. always a problem. The clutch was a a, a massive was, was a, a problem. Delicate of the reliability. No, I don't clutch. know. It's, it's a, in those days, it was a seven and a quarter inch clutch uh, with two plates, and getting it to free, to make it free, you know, to disengage yeah, yeah, yeah. was always a problem. And the start of a Grand Prix is already very tense, 
obviously, and it's how long you're in gear. And uh, they still, I don't know what they do these days, but nowadays they used to come around. If you're on a pole, you'd sit there for a long time, wouldn't you? And you'd be in first gear because very few drivers are brave enough to take it out of gear you know, and sit there in neutral, which is what they should do, because then the clutch is shut and the clutch is cold and cooling down. But as soon as you push the clutch down and clump, put it in gear, the clutch is now dragging slightly. Uh, okay. You understand? It's attached to the, the, the clutch plates are attached to the gearbox. That's how it works. Yeah, uh, and they're yeah, stationary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other two plates are spinning. Yeah, yeah, and now the driver's got the thing at 10 grand, because he does. <laughs> they're all there, because they can't hear the engine. Nobody can hear the engine. So they've all got it, you know, these days, it's all done by computer. They don't, they don't expect they're not even allowed to touch the throttle. It's just a button, wait and wait for it yeah, to go. They, they, they're not doing anything. But nowadays, the driver had it in first gear, had the clutch down, and many Grand Prix, you would see cars get penalised or start early because the clutch would start to grab. And there's nothing the driver could do about it, apart from take it out of gear, but then he'd be terrified he'd never get it back in gear. Yeah. You understand? Yeah, yeah. Cars would start yeah, to yeah, go. Yeah. <laughs> so I've noticed cars rolling some of the old footage. And yeah. the drivers go. So how do they, how do they get away with I'm that? Sorry with the language. I forgot that. Because <laughs> uh, <you know, laughs> the car, st the, the clutch is heating up and itself pumps up its own ass. Because as it gets hot, it gets bigger uh, and then course, yeah, grabs yeah, yeah, more. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's what terrified them. Mm. And you know, getting a clutch that freed. You know, that would be a that would be a classic work why the number one driver and number two driver, there'd be two clutches in the truck and they'll all be would put up in a lathe and they would have been examined to see the run out. And the one that had zero run out would go in the number one car, and the one that had two thou run out would go in the number two car. Okay. And this is what happens in motor racing. Yeah, you know, Ferraris have forty sets of tires set up a practice and they've put them up and they've checked them for balance and they've checked them for run out and some of them are absolutely perfect. The size is the same. They've got no run out and they've got no weights on them. That's set number one. Guess who gets that? Yeah. And set number two is the next set. Guess who gets that? And set 10, which has got bumps, has got wheel weights and the, the, the stag is wrong. Guess who gets that? The number two driver. Yeah. And when there's two engines in the truck, one's got 500 horsepower, one's got 480, guess who gets the one that's got 500? Yeah. But if you out qualify him with the wrong tires and the less engine and the run out clutch, then they talk to, oh, ooh, who's going to get the better engine? This is what, this is what um, the Red Bull drivers are up against. You know, they're trying to establish their dominance over the other. Yeah, who's... Because once whoever's the consistently the quicker, then the management will just... They can't bring themselves not to. Though they swear the two cars are the same, yeah. they're not. The best mechanics go on the number one car. The best management, the best race engineer, the best tires, well, the natural, best engines, it? just the way it yeah, goes. Yeah, yeah. It's human nature. You're not going to run, you're not going to have a, a, a lottery which set of tires are going to go on which one. You're not going to toss for it. No. No. <laughs> Before we go on back onto the M23, where, because you've driven the M23, haven't you? Briefly, yeah. Silverstone. So, but a quick word for our, from our sponsors, Mercedes Benz. And Alison, I know you've got a couple of. Mercedes-Benz. Yes. Oh, yes. I've been. I've been a, many Mercedes-Benz owners. I've had. I've had a 1968 280SL sports car, Pagoda, it's called. Yep. Uh, for many for 30 years, and I. I was the first person to rally one. Though the works rallied them, but yep. nobody noticed. A guy called Boringer won the European Rally Championship driving a 220 saloon and a SL, but they were considered not rally cars. People turned their nose up at them. Hairdresser's car, but I went rallying in them, and now they're prolific. Lots of people run them because they're very yeah. good cars. And I have a 250 SL, which is an earlier one, same car, and I have a 67 450 V8 saloon in New Zealand, which is a lovely old thing, Excellent. big barge. Excellent. Sort of, ladies love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mercedes are uh, giving under 17s the chance to drive Mercedes latest cars uh, at Mercedes Benz World. Um, under 17s, no experience necessary, no license necessary. Uh, you drive alongside an approved driving instructor with a dual controlled vehicle. Um, and it's all at Mercedes Benz World, which is uh, a great day out anyway. Mm -hmm. Just go to their website, uh, yeah. look up the under 17 experience, and um, it's a perfect gift for the summer, keep the kids entertained during the summer. So. Well, I'm perfect for this because exactly. I have taken my granddaughter already have you? at 12. Excellent. And she has driven in a Mercedes that wow. Mercedes World and loved it. Brilliant. She can drive now. Well, yeah, that's good, isn't it? She spent you know, four hours, whatever it is, you pay two hours, you know, yeah. I forget how long. 
and uh, she drove with an instructor and then she drove. So she's driven. She's yeah. 15 now, but she got, she got to drive when she was 12. Brilliant. And she loved it. There you go. An endorsement. Ah, yeah. I'm, I'm, well, as, soon as, my, as soon as my grandsons are old enough, or tall enough, I'm going to take them as well. Brilliant. So they can get their first drive. You know, I was driving when I was 10. Well, she had taken me. I, I, I was on my own. I was eight. And it was in a mini metro and I drove it. So the car was parked here, there was a skip there, I went like that, and then went just straight to the skip, and mum said, no more driving. <laughs> <laughs> but no one was with me, no one taught me yeah. how to do it, I was just sat well, on my own. <laughs> I taught myself, but I, I taught myself, but um, it was, I had a field. Yes. My father left the car, and uh, it took me hours to work out how to go back, which was it had a column change. Right. And it could make it go forward, it had four speeds, and a column change, I couldn't make it go backwards. And then eventually, just all my accident, I pulled, you pull the knob out, and push it down, clunk, and that was reversed. Oh, yeah. So I managed to get it out of the garage, and I got to drive it around the field endlessly, Brilliant. and then put it back again. And he never said a word, but for certain he knew I'd been driving yes. it, because A, it would have been different, and B, it was a government car, and it had to, you had to account for the mileage, oh. and, I, and he would have put down his logbook, and he would have done, hello, <laughs> <laughs> it's done eight miles or something, <laughs> but I could drive. And uh, so I taught myself to drive, and. Um, uh, at eight or something. And then when I was 12, uh, around about 12, when I went to high school, I used to drive my mother all the time because in New Zealand you could get your license for 15, but you could drive somebody with a, the licensed person when you were 12. So I literally used to take my mum to the shops and sit outside and then she'd come out and then I'd take her to the hairdressers or whatever. I was her chauffeur, which she loved having a chauffeur. Yeah. And uh, it worked, you know, and I've been driving ever since. You know, you know I love driving, that's why I still do this rally. Yeah. Yeah, and Mercedes Benz as well. So yep. it's almost like we planned it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perfect fit. So, did you have any assistance when you got on the M23? Was anyone there to give you the step by step guide of how to, oh, how to drive how it? How to drive it. How well, to... I, knew, I knew most of it um, from driving Heskers. It yeah. was all pretty much the same. The dog leg, the first here, is always a bit confusing um, because it's, you know, it's quite a lot to think about yeah. when you're driving along. Maybe, you know, it's, not my car or the rest of it, and you know there's a rev limiter on it as well, as well like like modern cars have. That's the tricky part. So you, sometimes I thought I was in 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 one gear and I was actually in a different gear, and right. so you think it's trying trying to go up a gear and end up going down a gear by accident. That that was the most uh, was the most tricky bit that I had to concentrate on. Every, well, everything else was pretty natural. How did it compare to the Hesketh? Did it feel like an, an well, I did, I did, obviously front to the back? Neither of them, I've ever had, I had a chance to drive in anger. Right. I was only just pottering around with a camera cut. Uh, well, I popped in Hesketh once, I had a few clicker laps, so good with uh, It feels very much the same, I think. Really? It sounds the same. And, well, I mean, obviously, there's a slight different comfort in the car. I think the car was more comfortable, actually. Um, you, uh, Alice, you were there as well when. Freddie drove the car. At Silverstone, I was yes. there, yes, because I was there with uh, with Murray, and uh, we had so got some very nice photographs because you're know, sitting on either side of the car. And it looks like his mm. dad. You know, yeah. Inside the helmet with the helmet on, it looks just like his dad. So it's really de de deja vu for me sitting yeah. on the side of the monocoque because I spent many many hours sitting on the monocoque of N23s, yeah. talking to drivers, <laughs> <laughs> but um, including his dad. Yeah. How did that compare to the? M26, the M23, because um, Paul Fernley, our journalist, has asked how good that car really was, because it came on quite late, didn't it? it came on the M23 <laughs> was a brilliant car, yeah. uh, it was a yeah. great design, and it suited, it, it, it was the first ground effect car, uh, well, there was lots of accidental ground effect cars, right. so we won't go into that, but it was the first car that anybody tried to make into a ground effect car. What, the M23? M23, I put really? skirts around it. I put yeah. skirts around the outside of the N23 in 1976. South African Grand Prix was the first attempt. And right. uh, they were taken off by Teddy because the other teams told them they were illegal. But then the next race, I put them back on and nobody could get me to take them off. <laughs> they weren't illegal. And so the car had skirts on it and we cut a hole in the floor and we got depression under the car, which we could measure. Now we had like 300 pounds of downforce for free with no drag. Didn't make the car any slower on the straight. It just went way faster around the race. Yeah, track. yeah, yeah. So that was um, that was the kind of that. birth birth of the of the downforce, and so the M twenty three was a good car, and it got better when we put the radiators in the sides because it had a bigger floor area, and had more downforce, uh, which was famously your father couldn't couldn't pick when we had the famous thing in Jarama where we got banned in Jarama because the car was too wide, mm. so we decided to put the car back super legal. So we took 
some of the development we'd put on the car off. Though we thought they were illegal, we thought we were going to get attacked by Ferraris because Ferraris had two lawyers at every racetrack and so on. So we put the car back to the old configuration and the car was way slower. And, everybody, and Ferraris said, ah, you see the car's slower because it's narrower. We said, no, no, narrow makes no difference. It's yeah, one centimetre, just ridiculous that anybody would think that make any difference. But they persevered with this. And then we went testing, fortunately, your father and I alone uh, with a couple of mechanics at, at uh, Port Ricard. And we did a, a thing where we changed the car to the new configuration, which we'd made legal, you know, made more legal uh, than it was before. We thought it was legal before, but now we made it super legal by angling the radiators because there was a, I don't want to bore you, but there was a, a rule about oil fittings couldn't be more than a certain distance from the middle of the car. And the radiators we used in Spain had necks on them. They had cheap necks, so the radiator went along like this and then there was a fitting. And you could have argued that that was deliberate um, rule breaking, you know, because the fitting should have been here, but that's very obscure. But anyway, when we went back to Ricard, we had the radiators angled so that the fittings were inside the rule. And we tested, and the car was way quicker. And then we put it back to the old configuration. It was way slower. But your father insisted it was just him or the racetrack. And he got really he got angry because I put it back again. And again, it was faster. And he still insisted it was no better. But in fact, it was way better because the, gra the ground effect was good. That was the thing because he couldn't feel it. You know, the ground effect was not immediately obvious. But in fact, we took the oil coolers. Well, surely in a high speed you pour a car in high speed took, corners. We took, 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 took the coolers away from under the wing. And, and increased the floor area because these, these pods which were on the back of the monocoque made the monocoque bigger mm -hmm. and, and had skirts on them. So we had more downforce and less drag and the thing was way quicker. And the rest is history because we won the next, day, the next day, weekend. We had the French Grand Prix and uh, he won it going away. Mm -hmm. Ferraris blew up both engines. I think we finished first and second. And uh, the, the meeting with the tribunal in Paris was that Wednesday. And we were able to go and say, look, Car's narrow and it's quick. And the old boys understood this. Ah, they said, okay, you can have your eight points back from Spain. So we got the points back. How did you persuade him to go testing? Very difficult. Yeah. Because that's one of your father's, yeah, he, one of his shortcomings was that he was naturally lazy and naturally didn't want to go testing. He didn't see much point to it. And uh, though he did, he knew, because he talked to Nicky, you know what real racing drivers were meant to do. They were meant to work hard and go to the factory and talk to the mechanics, and the, you know, which is what Nicky did, but your father never did. He never came to the factory. Paul Fernley asked if you had any tricks to persuade mm. him. Paul Fernley uh, asked if you had any tricks to persuade him to go testing, or was it the money you could? No, make no, few, it didn't uh, make any difference to his money. It should have made, you know, it should have been motivation that, that you know, a race miles. There's nothing wrong with race miles, and and b you're learning all the time. Um, and you're learning the racetrack as well. You know, it's like a simulator. You know, why wouldn't you not go testing? Yeah. You know, just it, you should have been asking. Probably, he you should, have, he should have been asking us to go testing at every racetrack. And I, and I, because I was the only person who did it, rented all the racetracks that could be rented the week before right. in '76. So I had them booked. Nobody else did, because as soon as the calendar came out, I got my secretary to, to try and book the week before, because you weren't allowed to test the week of the race. Uh, you weren't allowed to test Monday up. You, know, you had to be the week before. Yeah. But I did this in Canada. I did it uh, Japan. I did it famously. I took the car to Japan. Yeah, I and he, and he, <laughs> and he, he came to Japan. <laughs> and this, and this to me is, is you know, it's, it's not well. It's part of the story. If I was running a Grand Prix team now, I would be sending my junior drivers to the next country straight away. When the race was over, they wouldn't go home to their mums or girlfriends or Paris or wherever, they'd go to the next racetrack and live there. Because if you live in Brazil for a week or two weeks before, you're so much more acclimatized to the weather and the time change. You're right on cue. Mm -hmm. And James and I were there for two weeks. And uh, he was you know, only too happy because um, yeah. the hotel had all the British so Airways we stewards every yeah. night. And fresh ones came in every day. And uh, we had a big gym where you could go swimming and play squash and so on. And we'd been to the racetrack and we knew where the racetrack was and where the loos were and where the country hotel was. And you can see it when the other teams turn up. They're all hyper. They don't know where the pits are. They don't know where the hotel is. They don't know anything. And you can see it. that A whole lot of their energy is just going in this familiarization. Mm. Whereas we were familiar. We were locals. We knew the racetrack. You know, the guys in the gate knew us. You know, we, we were on first name terms with the whole place. 
And this made a big difference. And uh, <clears throat> as I say, I would, if I was doing it again, I would make sure that any new boys or even even experienced drivers, the you know, the the, the, um, the jet lag, the sooner you get there, mm. the better you're going to be. So how long were you in Canada for that year? Oh, same thing, the week before. Yeah. And that's when we got the news. Um, and that's when we got the news where we lost the points from the British Grand Prix. And that's a sad story because we did bring the British Grand Prix absolutely 100%. We won that fair and square in the race car. And Ferrari's managed to bend a rule that got us, you know, allowed the tribunal to take the points away from us. And, uh, and so we, we, we lost the eight points from the British Grand Prix, which was a really bad blow because then we thought we were not going to win the World Championship. We were way behind by then with only three races to go. Yeah. So I let go of James because he had no manager. You follow me? He didn't yeah. have a man. They all have Michael. They've got six of them or something. Probably you know, massing their egos. Well, he had Uncle, uh, he had Uncle Nor, but no, he Nor, wasn't, Nor wasn't much of a manager. He, but, anything, he, but he Nor wasn't there either. Certainly wouldn't have had any, any ability to control him. But he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't <laughs> that Watkins then. And, no, he, no. and he wasn't that Canada. Well, I think he was more of just finances and stuff like that rather than an actual sports manager. Yeah. I think. And, uh, he, uh, Got a heavy night. In yeah, so I let, I let him get out of hand in Canada. And uh, yeah, we were drinking on race night, you know, race eve. And you know, he, was, he was, um, uh, had this lead singer of the band in the, in the motel. He was servicing every few hours when she had a break in her set. And then I went to bed at midnight. He was still up. And we had to go to the racetrack at 7 in the morning or something for the warm-up. And at the warm-up, there he was with this girl with the same clothes on, totally disheveled, wrecked. Yeah, and we and we and we went to the racetrack in Bill Smith's camper and, and partied on the way to the racetrack. Still, and uh, won the race. Boom, oh, boom. Well, Paul finally says he. Boom, <laughs> <laughs> boom. <laughs> and then we went to Watkins Glen, and we still thought we didn't have a chance, and we misbehaved again. And then we were in this this uh, Seneca Lodge, which is this lovely motel, and he was there, raced him, drunk again, dancing, singing. You know. I went to bed at midnight again. He was still there. He went off back to the motel. We went to the racetrack on a Sunday morning. Boom, boom, won the race. <laughs> now it was getting serious. Yeah. So then we calmed down, shipped the car to Japan for testing, which had to go the Monday morning. It had to go that Monday morning, but I got it there. Yeah. And that was the only flight in the week that would take the plane and take the car. Fooled Ferraris into not taking theirs by answering answer all Ferraris phone calls. In the tech center, brilliant. Yeah, tell, them, right? tell them, tell them that the manager wasn't there. That he was playing golf and whatever. It's all good <laughs> fun. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't ship their car. And we did ship our car. We you, flew out there. And the testing was useless because the car actually failed on the Saturday morning. But we had a lot of fun, and um, we settled right in Japan, James and I and the boys. I can tell stories for hours. <laughs> <laughs> Did to when uh, a question from here from Simon Wilson asked about when James went to the Formula Atlantic series, was that to get acclimatized in America effectively? No, that was money. Uh, there was uh, had this race in Chantilly Beach every year, yep. and they had this Formula Atlantic series, which was I think like Can Am, I think it was American Canadian, and there was a successful series. And every year they would pay Grand Prix drivers to go. And in those days, you know, we were stupid. We let our driver go. These days, I would never let him go, you know, uh, because he'd get injured, you know. But as it was, we said, oh, yeah, off he went, break between races. And this is, uh, this is the Vigil Villeneuve story, of course. Yeah, yeah, that's when he came back to Because he, he went off there for the weekend uh, and raced in Gilles' team, I think. Yep. Gilles like, just pissed off into the distance, didn't he? Yeah, and, and, and unlike, unlike you know, most times, you know, race drivers would never tell you that the, the race driver was great. But James came back and said, oh, You've um, uh, this, you know. I just raced this weekend against this kid called Villeneuve, and boy, is he quick! So we discussed it, and we were looking for another driver anyway. We had, I forget now, Tanbe was it then, or Mass, and we were looking for a replacement for Mass. And um, so we discussed this, and this guy Villeneuve had a manager. So we rang up, or Teddy rang up this guy's manager and said, yeah, we'd like to talk to, G to Gilles about maybe doing the end races, because in those days we used to run a car quite often at Canada and America, because of the last races of the season. So we'd run the third car, because if it got crashed, okay, you know, it wasn't that big a, you know, the season was nearly over. Yep. And it was quite common for people to run three cars at, at, the, end, at the end races. Silverstone was first. Um... And uh, 
yeah, we have to let me finish the story. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so we talked to Jill and we talked to his manager on, let's say, Monday. And on Tuesday morning, the receptionist rang up and said, there's a young man here called Gilles Villeneuve, wants to see you. I said, oh, okay. And that's the fantastic thing, that we just talked to him on the phone about maybe running him in a car the end of the year, six months from now. And he put the phone down and bought a ticket to England. Wow. He went like that and bought himself a ticket to England. He didn't say anything to us, he didn't ask us where the factory was, whether we'd be there. He knew we were there because we were talking to him the day before and we, it was the British Grand Prix coming up or, you know, we're in between races, anyway. So he, he sussed all that and he just came. And this was an immediate hit because he came. We didn't ask him to come. He paid for himself. He turned up, showed him the cars. Oh, loved the car, got in the car like Bruce used to do and made engine noises and tried to steer it. <laughs> oh, looked at all the drawings, met everybody in the factory, went around and was totally enthusiastic about cars. And we said, this is the boy for us. This, How did he compare? This boy suits us just fine. Just on his demeanor, you know, the way he was interested in cars and he, talked, he spoke very bad English, you know, very, very strongly accented English, but perfectly legible, but, you know, very accented. And so we said, OK, we'll run three cars at Silverstone because that's the home race. So that's another chance to run a third car. If we have a crash or, you know, we can repair the situation because we've got the factory to do it. And we've got more personnel. So we ran him at Silverstone. And uh, sadly, the car, the, the, the water gauge broke during the race. So he stopped to report that the gauge had gone flat. And we checked it was fine and sent him off again. Otherwise, he would have finished in the points uh, in his first race. And I remember so well on the first practice, and I was running the car, and he, uh, he did 16-1, 16-2, 15-9. It was go, you know, going down, and he never did a slow lap. All the laps were you know, good, and his times were coming down, getting more and more competitive. Then during the lunchtime, you know, the break, because we used to have two hours break then, you know, I mean, we might run for two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon, those kind of days. Qualifying was two hours and two hours. Every lap was timed. Anyway, journalists started to come back. Nigel, I think one of them who was here the last time was a podcast and said, boy, you should see your boy spin at Beckett's and he spun here and he spun there and he spun on every corner on the racetrack except Woodcote, which was a bit too <laughs> tricky to spin at. So I said to him, you, that, these journalists are telling me you spun at every corner. He said, yeah, how else do I tell how fast it goes? And I said, you didn't hit it, I think, and it doesn't show on the watch. He said, no, no, because he was so good his car control was just uncanny because we didn't know this, but he would spin the car, and you saw it later in races. He would spin the car and go down through the gearbox and be facing the right way. He never had to drop so the clutch and turn around. So he'd lose a second or something? <laughs> yeah, he'd lose half a second. Yeah, he'd do 13.9, 13.7, and that was the spin. And he'd go, whoop, whoop. He was almost, he was ready for the spin. Yeah, he was checking out how quick it was. And if he couldn't catch it, he would just let it go, get it the right way, change down to the right gear, and he would lose no, hardly any time at all. He was a natural, and uh, he would have made a perfect driver for us, but sadly we didn't hire him. Yeah. Uh, Teddy managed to force him to go to Ferraris in a strange way. Yeah, and you were definitely doing Ferrari that same year, I believe. Sorry? You were definitely doing Ferrari that same year. The red thing on the archives. That, that's news to me, but yeah, um, it was, I know at the end of 74, well, in 74, he did a test for Ferrari. Yeah. Um, and not many people know about this. I was flicking through, I was sitting on, sitting on the crap at my friend's house, flicking through, looking through a Ferrari book. And there was a tiny, um, there was a picture of Ferrari, and you could just see the black helmet. And I could just see a bit of the yellow paint. I thought, hang on, I, rec I recognize that helmet, but in yeah. the wrong car. So I rang Uncle Dave. And I said, Dave, did, has Dave, Dad ever driven a Ferrari? And he said, yes, actually, he did. In 74, he had a test. He was invited for a test. Um, and, he was, and, and that driver, the 75 seat, which was Nicky's seat, Nicky's was offered seat. to him. Um, and then the, the conversation Dave remembers was, so Dave was only about 11 years old at the time. Uh, my, uh, Dad and Grandma discussing on moral grounds whether he should or, should, should or shouldn't take the offer from Ferrari yeah. because of what Heskis had done so much for him. And then, so he decided, no, I won't go for it. I'll stay with Heskiff. Yeah. But yeah, 70, 78, apparently, he met with um, Daniele Odetto uh, at Monaco and then agreed a deal for the next year. But apparently, the reason he couldn't sign the deal was 
he already had an agreement with Vauxhall, and he there was some there was something contract some contractual problems which meant that he couldn't then work for Ferrari. That, uh, were you involved with you, Alistair? No, no, I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have been involved then. You see, yeah, because um, yeah. Uh, so that was that was seventy-eight for the seventy-nine season. For the seventy-nine season, yeah, yeah. and then he started seventy-eight with you, didn't he? No, uh, seventy-nine with you. Seventy-six. No, 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 sorry. The 79 season, he started in a McLaren, but then finished in a Wolf, correct? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. yeah. Do you think after 76, there was a part of him that would have retired there and then as world champion? I, um, well, only going on what he said, I think if the car was... Um, if, everything, if everything was going better, I think the M26, he wasn't too fond of. He said, well... Yeah, me neither. No. <laughs> oh, so, right, give, you give, share his thoughts. Give, give, you know, give him my own. I would just kept <coughs> racing the M23. Right. Well, that's what he built, wanted. Built an M23 lighter, used the same construction technique as the M26, and built a lighter M23 because that was one of our problems. The car. That's what he wanted. Our car, our car was heavy and I you know, it had a bigger floor area. Yep. It was it was a better car. Um, Always what? No, well, his well, quoting him, he said. Um, Retiring from Grand Prix racing because I'm not prepared to risk my neck for sixth place. I'll do it for first, yep. but not for sixth. So, yeah, um, he thought he'd give it a rest. And actually, I believe and I'm not saying this is um, this is a fact, but apparently, when he said to Wolf he was going to leave, Wolf said, "We'll pay, pay you four million to stay." He would have been the highest sports paid sportsman in history at the time. Wow, dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> So we had a couple of questions uh, actually from readers. Uh, one from David Ruddick saying, "Do you think he, did he ever look forward to a longer career in Formula One?" I guess the answer is yes and no. No, I think that, no. I think he and most of the drivers wanted to get in and get out while they're still versatile. Um, yeah, so he had a kind of a, a not acknowledgement of the fear, didn't he? He was one of the few drivers that was aware and would acknowledge the fear of being in a racing car. And being, mm. was, I mean, I dread to think. That, I mean, just. Yeah, race, to, right, to, race. to race in those cars, just driving those cars is quite scary. And I've got to say, say to myself, Fred, there's no, you know, when I'm in the car, there's no protection. If you go off, you're not walking yeah. up. No, the, 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 but the M23, of course, was far more substantial than an M7 or an M14. Yes. Because uh, you, uh, it was, was massively, and it already had deformable structure. We had, a rule, we had you know, a rule that said you had to have this deformable structure on the sides of the car. And the M23 was one of the one of the reasons for the M23 was we were able to put the deformable structure twice. We were able to put it on the side of the car and on the other side of the pod. So we had the required. It was a lot stronger than the other car. Yes, it was wider and stronger. And uh, and then of course you came along with the downforce cars, the cars what we call the, the skirt cars, which came shortly afterwards when we had the sliding skirts. Yeah. And the cars had massive downforce, unbelievable downforce, and. Uh, and they had to be made incredibly strong because they were, had so much downforce, they destroyed themselves. They literally just folded up. The monocoques weren't strong enough, the body weight wasn't strong enough to withstand the downforce. Because when we really got the tunnels working and the skirts which were sliding on the road, I don't know if you realise this, but for one season we had Grand Prix cars that had sliding skirts that sealed off the air on the side of the car and they ran on the road successfully. And the car rolled and bounced up and down, and these skirts stayed there. And they ran them over curbs, and they lasted for 200 miles. It's unbelievable, the, te the simple technology. We got it to work. And those cars were massively strong, and just by accident, because of the downforce. But then, when people had big high-speed accidents in them, they got out and went, wow, what happened there? So then we realized, or the whole you know, circus, in my opinion, realized you could build a car that was strong enough to withstand you know, a high-speed accident into the Arco or a wall or whatever. And then when they went away from those cars, they said, okay, we've got to keep this, you know, this feature, which we can now legislate. So that's how you got the modern Grand Prix car, which is built like a brick shithouse. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, but that, it actually came by accident from the wing cars. These were these parallel monocoques, and they were, everybody had one, and, um, and you know, had the tunnels was underneath. It was the car that had the first... Chassis? Well, actually, I can dispute that. that they claim, yes, that Hercules in America made the first, uh, but I'm, I'm certain that they weren't, because ATS, which I was running, had the first sort of um, monocoque. But a guy called Gustav Brunner, who was the designer, had the, the that's interesting, because guess who it was done by? It was done by the Swiss guys that are still running Grand Prix cars now. 
Sauber. Sauber. They were, mm. they were, I don't think they were even Grand Prix car makers. No. There were a company in Switzerland that did carbon fiber. So we had an English uh, mock, um, um, you know, model made, model maker made a full size car that was sent to Sweet Switzerland, uh, uh, to Sauber, and they made a full monocoque. And it was a full monocoque as well. It wasn't like the Hercules, which I think was two bits yeah. joined together. The ATS one was completely one piece. And I'm pretty sure that factually that's correct, though I left the team. Right. So I wasn't there when this, when this car was produced. But, and, it, and, and it was so early in the technology that we had to put lumps in the, sh in the monocoque to be machined afterwards because we didn't know what the shrinkage and so on would be. You know, right. Now they, put that in, they, make, they make it all perfectly ready to go. But we had to make it, you know, with, but I'm pretty sure in fact, the first full carbon monocoque was made by ATS. Wow. Gustav Brunner was the designer. So he, and he was Swiss, and it was a Swiss company. Right. But the Patent Magazine England made the patent because Patent Magazine England were better. Right. And, so, um, so that, the onset of um, ground effects, I think that was kind of when your dad also initially thought these cars are too easy to, to drive. When he said, uh, the drive, he said in 1979, the driver didn't count for enough. So, what would he kind of make of modern Formula One now when the driver is being? I think he'd be watching. It's very hard to say, but I don't think he'd like it for, for, for many reasons, really. Um, I mean, I haven't driven a modern Grand Prix car or, or even sat in one and been told what's what. There's an awful lot of buttons. Yeah. Um, an awful lot of buttons. I'll definitely be pressing the wrong ones. <laughs> this would be a nightmare. Um, I don't think he'd approve of that. I certainly, I know he would hate all the. All the rules and regulations. Even Bernie said that the other day. Said that's absolutely ridiculous. It's, it's killing the sport. Yeah. And I know that sport has lost a lot of fans. And that's the one thing I did. I asked Bernie. I said, you know, what makes Formula One? He says, fans. You've got to put on a show. Fans don't come. No sponsors come. There's no money. No one, no one goes racing. Yeah. Um, and then as a result, now they're they're, they're killing the sport. Um, so, yeah. I think that would be pretty upset. Yeah. I've got a question from Brent and Caitlin, um, who did say, what do you think he'd make of the halo? I guess with his um, importance on safety that he had, he'd probably approve of the halo. Yeah, so don't, yeah, he was, um, he was very safety conscious. And I like to put it out there that there is a quote that's become quite well, well known, but that's not, that wasn't that quote. So it says, um, to hell with safety, all I want to do is race, James Hunt. Mm. That is absolute crap. rubbish. That's on, this is guy selling this T-shirt yeah, with yeah. that on it. There's a T-shirt, James Hunt. Very nice T-shirt, but it's got this quote <laughs> up the bottom, which is rubbish. Yeah, so that would be the last thing I would say. Dad, dad was all for I was, I was involved with your dad, you're in the safety, and, and he and I uh, used to argue or discuss it, but I wanted to make the helmet part of the car. Maybe. Well, the, the, the whole purpose of the, you know, the seat belt has got you actually trapped in the car, right? Yeah. And if you're not conscious, you can't undo it. You know, somebody has to undo it for you. There's no, yeah, it's still that way. Somebody has to reach inside yep. and undo it. So my idea was that we would put, we'd make the helmet part of the car. So the car, car guy would get, the driver would get in, you put the helmet on. And, and I mean, they're nearly there with USAC. They've got tethers on them and cables because of the G-force. You're getting so close to having the helmet. So my, my plan was to have the helmet fastened to the car. So then the driver could, A, use it to lean on, on the G-force, instead of, because yeah, when, when we had the ground effect cars, these, re, these parallel cars, the huge problem was the neck, your neck. I mean, People were blacking out. Oh yeah, PK would, PK would do one or two laps, get out, and we'd have a bucket, a bit like your dad, throw up in the bucket because of the G-force. Whoa! And then you'd get back in the car and you'd go again. And, uh, I remember classically at Zambort, uh, we had this car, and at 180 miles an hour, it would start to do this flutching business where the thing cut, cut off. And he said, you know, I can't see and I can't breathe, but don't change the car, because this car's so fast. And he would see the shape of the grandstand go past and know to brake. And then he couldn't find the brake pedal because the car was shaking so much, so he put a side on the brake pedal, really like nice. PK, so he could put his foot off the throttle and, Hit the stop and then push the brake. Well, madness. <laughs> Absolutely madness. Well, 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 couldn't see and couldn't breathe. But only on the straight, you see, because the trouble with downforce is on the square of the speed, as right. you probably know, that you know, it's at 100 miles an hour, you've got X, and at 200 miles an hour, it's not two times, it's 10 times. You know, it goes like that. 
So you've got this hugely unwanted downforce, which is now why they've allowed them to hit the ground again. They weren't allowed to hit the ground. We had them hitting the ground. We had sparks coming yeah, out of the back. Ching, 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 ching. Because if they want, if they want, we would have had wheels on them. I mean, literally. I don't know why they don't do it now. Now they allow them to hit. They could have just little jockey wheels under the monocar. So on the straight, they would just go. But the sparks are good. They're obviously stupid. Yeah. I mean, we we used to tame them because it was light, but it made an enormous amount of sparks. Well, it's really stupid. You can't imagine how stupid people are motor racing. <laughs> All of them. Well, All maybe, of them. Maybe. Because we had the sliding skirts, which had, uh, which had ceramic on the bottom. And this ceramic didn't spark, and it lasted 200 miles. So they could have ceramic strips on the bottom of that car. would make no sparks. It would never wear out. It would run the whole race. The, so, sparks, no. the sparks look good. Yeah, the sparks look good. <laughs> Look great ones, but pretty don't look, don't look so good when you got them all coming in your face. No, if you're exactly. the driver behind you, and your car, <laughs> and your car's leaking fuel. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, or your thing. your car's leaking fuel, or the one in front is. And yeah. the sparks, and these titanium sparks last a long time. So, from a logical point of view, you couldn't have think of a more dangerous thing to do. <laughs> That's true. That's true. We are rapidly running out of time. But there's no logic to motor racing, just like there isn't to anything. No. Uh, that's, a bad, that's not a bad thing necessarily. <laughs> uh, one question to wrap up uh, is from Anthony Jenkins. It's quite simple. Uh, James's sim helmet was simple, yeah, iconic. Um, what would he have made of the drivers changing them every season, in every race? I don't know. I mean, he, he is. He picked his his school car, the Wellington car. He was very proud of his school. His father yeah. went there, and he went there. And I was supposed to go there, but I was too thick. Um, <laughs> and. Well, I think in, the, in those days, all the drivers kept their same. That was yeah, their so sort it was of part the, of their the, personality, and I think yeah. it's a shame that they changed them. That, you know, the signature. It's, yeah, it's very difficult now to tell who's in the car. It drives me mad. Yeah. Because you know. once again, they're, they're stupid. The people who run motor racing are essentially pretty stupid. Because once again, logically, very little to pick whether who the driver is. You can't see the number of the car. You can't hardly see the livery because the liveries are so complicated. So the one thing that would be distinctive would be the helmet. So you would stick. You'd be told. You'd pick your helmet and you stick with that helmet, yeah. not the other way around. Because at least the audience has a chance to say, ah, the blue helmet with the white stripes, that's so-and-so. But now they can't even tell. They can't see the number of the car. The cars all look the same. Yeah. Talk about stupid. Yeah, no, you couldn't make up how stupid they are. The delivery of all of the cars would be very difficult to tell them apart. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty bad. It's pretty hard anyway. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> because they're not distinctive colours, and it's the nice thing about the McLaren being orange again. Though the sadly, right, it's the wrong one. orange. Well, it's <laughs> Hello. Show, it? it's getting a bit Hello. <laughs> we decided to paint it orange, but not the right orange. Because yeah. <laughs> okay. when it was the original orange, it stood up like DBs. You know, all every picture of a Grand Prix or any magazine from then on, motorsport included, would always have a picture of a McLaren because they looked so good in colour. Yep. Even though they were tenth on the grid, they would be there because mm. they looked the you know the color photographs look great. But yes, to recap, the the helmet should stay the same. Yeah, it's just stupid. And do you see a James Hunt character on the grid? Do you think? Sorry. Do you see a James Hunt character anywhere on well, the no, grid right now? Yeah. Kimmy's kind of as close as yeah, he's yeah the closest as you get, but he's. Yeah. Hasn't got Kimmy, Kimmy of... wins because he has got no character at all. Yeah, <laughs> he, he's the winner because he's like a zombie, and that's funny. Yeah, he's brilliant. Right. <laughs> no, I think, it's I think shame, the most sort of the bubbliest of drivers of them is probably Ricardo. Yeah, Ricardo is yeah. yeah, Ricardo's the only one with that, with any style. He's got only a bit of a bit of yeah. spunk to him. Yeah. Um, Lewis, you know, his driving is is incredible, but he's just so bloody dull. Yeah. Um, which is yeah, real shame. Uh, who else? Well, I, I don't know Verstappen, but he seemed quite 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 fun in his interviews. Yeah, he had a bit of a giggle. Um, I think he could be a hell of a driver. Well, I think he's a hell of a driver. But get him in the right car. Yep. With, with the right amount of luck, you know, the mechanical failures, I think he'll be very tough to do. It's, a, it's kind of a throwback to the to the old days in the Verstappen. So mm. the way he races, the way he's always on the limit, and mm. so it's refreshing. Yeah, he's got a bit of building up about him. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, good luck with the uh, chase for Le Mans as well. Thank and you. Alistair, good luck with the next rally, yeah. whatever that may be. Yeah. And thank you, Jack, for behind the camera mics. And uh, we will, yeah, see you again soon.
Great design is not only how things look, but also how well they work. The new GLC Urban Edition, now from £349 per month for a limited time only.